in Hebrews chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading at verse 8 where it says, Although he was a son, the he in this context is Jesus, although Jesus was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Uh, there's, there's a good deal there, and we're going to break it down a little bit in, in the next few moments, but I wanted to connect briefly to last week. Um, some of you will recall that last week wasn't, uh, it not only wasn't intended to have a part two, it wasn't really intended to be a part one on my part, but that's kind of just the way things roll. But I, I recognized as I was praying this week that uh, I, I left some business unfinished in terms of what I believe the Spirit of God was saying to me, and so we're revisiting it. And everybody said, yay! <laughs> but uh, we're not going to do revisit everything from last week, but just to, to rehearse a couple of the things that were significant. Um, we were talking about growing. Um, that Peter, at the end of uh, Second Peter, tells us to to grow in grace, and we're to grow. We're to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? And we're supposed to be in the business of growing. We, uh, we tend to be achievement-oriented. We want to arrive. We want to get somewhere. But what we've been welcomed into here is a process that's going to continue as long as we're here. Growing is supposed to be a natural part of who we are. And what we're growing toward is what Ephesians 4 tells us, the fullness of the stature of Christ. And uh, as I look around, I recognize that we're not done growing. (laughs) If that's the standard, you know, if, if being cooler than you is the standard, well, maybe I've made it. But if the fullness of the stature of Christ is the standard, I think I've got a way to go. And, and when we recognize that that's what we're called to, we don't get quite so cocky about having arrived and feeling like I am awesome in some way because, you know, I've been nominated to become a deacon. Are you guys still here? So, <clears throat> and we were dealing with the, the oft-quoted phrase that uh, maturity doesn't come with age but with the acceptance of responsibility, that maturity isn't about getting older, it's about growing up. And many people manage to get older without growing up. And many people grow up without having to be very old. It's got quiet. So that's free. We'll just let that lay there. The, the other uh, issue that we were discussing some is that we live in a world which tends to treat the concept of delegation as a delegate to eliminate thing. I give you stuff to do so I won't have to do it. Move it your way so that I can be freer right? But it looks to me as though in the scriptures we're dealing more with a delegate to develop kind of mentality because there is nothing that Jesus ever asked any of his disciples to do that he couldn't have done better than them, that he couldn't have done more easily than them. There is not a single task he ever gave them that he couldn't have easily accomplished without their assistance. When you can turn water into wine, When you can tell storms to be calm, you don't need people to run errands for you. (laughs) It got quiet out here. There had to be some other motivation to engage them in the process other than there was too much work for him to accomplish alone. Are you still here? Something else is motivating that. And we get a picture of that in his statements in Mark 9 and Mark 10 when he tells us that the world is set up for people to be over and upon others, but that the kingdom of God isn't like that because those who will be greatest in the kingdom become servants and serve others. And that what we're looking to do is rather than rise to the pinnacle of a pyramid where we've got lots of people keeping us on top, we want to sink into the foundation towards where Jesus is at the pinnacle with everybody resting on Him. And so the closer I become to Jesus, the more I become like Jesus, the more weight I'm carrying. Not the more I have holding me up in my exalted position. Are are we all on that? Everybody's still glad you came. So back to this picture here. Although he was a son, 
He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. He learned obedience. Now, suffered, it suffered can mean suffered in the sense that you and I would mean suffered. It also is capable of meaning just experienced. Although it is, I should say, generally associated with experiences which are less than comfortable, less than happy. It doesn't have to be a grievous suffering. It's just talking about you've been through some stuff. You learned through a process, right? Learn. Um, uh, the word, I mean, it really does mean learn. There's not a lot to define there to increase knowledge. But uh, one thing that W. E. Vine mentions is that frequently by inquiry and observation, and then a little farther down, he says something about to the point of habit. We're talking about learning in the sense that things are, you're, you're watching, you're asking questions, and you're being indoctrinated, ingrained in these things. These things are being ingrained in you to the point where they're becoming habit. Learning the spelling test, learning the spelling words well enough to be able to pass the spelling test at the end of the week, but not being able to remember how to spell them next month is not the type of learning we're talking about. We're, we're talking about a learning which, which gets this, it, it's become a part of me. It's actually connected to, not as directly as you might have hoped, but connected to the word for disciple, which is a learner, uh, someone who's been trained and disciplined in something, Right? So he learned, Jesus learned. Whoa, scratch our heads and wonder about that for a moment. Jesus learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Now, let me back up a little bit. Um, Let's let's go into the background a little more before we get back into this in so much detail. When God made everything in Genesis, the fall has not yet happened. In Genesis 1, 2, and in, in the beginning of chapter 3, we're not looking at an earth which is under a curse. We're not looking at things which have gone in a bad direction. We're looking at things the way he set them up on purpose. And the first thing he does, he's just barely made Adam when he puts him in the garden and gives him a job. He puts him to work immediately. It's got quiet out here. And it doesn't say that he had a tedious job where he was just sweating and moaning all day long. And, but he has responsibility. He's been given a task. He's got an assignment. His function isn't to just lay about all day singing praises to God. He's got something to do. Now, uh, I should have probably started here, but you know, who, who's the greatest gardener that's ever been? Yeah, God. It's not Adam. It's God. The garden, if this was just strictly about efficiency, the garden was better off when God had it than when Adam did. (laughs) If the point was make the garden awesome, then keep Adam out. There's something else here besides get the task done, engaged. But from the very start, God is giving to us something to do. Something which we will grow through, something which develops us, something which gives us an opportunity to become mature by exercising responsibility. And as we read through chapter 2, it begins to look like it's intended to be a family responsibility. That as Adam and Eve bear children, the family is going to become engaged in gardening and not in this particular garden, but the garden is going to expand and cover the earth as humanity does. It's an awesome plan. It kind of gets messed up, but having an assignment is not under the curse. (laughs) Let me say that again. Having an assignment is not under the curse. There were assignments before there was a curse. Jesus was under assignment. Having been given something to do, having a responsibility, having the opportunity to be fruitful and to be engaged in something worthwhile is not part of the curse. Now the curse speaks of our work and finding work frustrating and unproductive, working hard and getting little for it is part of the curse, but having an assignment is not the curse. Are you still awake? 
And so we're coming back to Jesus here in Hebrews chapter 4. Though he was a son, he learned obedience he, by, by questions and observation. Obedience uh, became such a part of him that it was habitual to him from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, perfect is a word which tends to put us off because uh, we're all too acquainted with the fact that we're not perfect. But it's describing perfect in the sense of having come to the end, come to completion, having, having gone through the process, having been perfected, having, having completed or achieved the aim. He became, to all those who obey him, the source of eternal salvation. I think the King James Version calls him the author of eternal salvation. The source or the author uh, either is a perfectly adequate translation of the word. It's describing something which causes something to happen. An author is the reason why there's a book to read. A source in that sense, in this context, is describing something which causes something to happen. He's not just a resource in the background. He is the source in the sense that he's making it occur. He's bringing it to pass. Are, are you getting that? Now, the word obey is a very simple word. In uh, the Greek language, it simply means to listen under. So it, it has the idea of attentive listening. That I'm hearing, but I'm not just hearing like, you know, Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. But I'm, I'm getting it. I'm paying attention. I'm hearing under. Somebody speaks and I listen attentively because I want to do something. He learned that, it tells us, through the things which he experienced and went through. We who listen under him find that he is the source, the author of eternal salvation to us. All of what comes with redemption, all of what's new in Christ Jesus comes to us from Him because He is what drives it and makes it happen. And we encounter that as we listen under Him. As we are attentive to Him and pay attention to Him. As we let His will become our will and recognize that we're under assignment. We have something to do here. Is this making a little bit of sense to you? I want to receive assignments from the head of the church because I want to be developed by them and grow through them. I want to be able to say, as the, the stewards in the parable of the talents, they didn't directly say this, but they, it's implicit. In the background of the story, because I have been faithful with what I've been given, I'm prepared to deal with more. Bring something else to me. I've handled five well. Now if you give me ten, I will manage ten. Are, are you awake? I want to be faithful and effective in the assignments that I receive, in the callings that I have, in the grace that's been given to me, so that I can be found about the Father's business in just that way. Is that making a little bit of sense to you? Yes. Now, um, mm. all right, I'm, I'm not done, I don't think, with Hebrews chapter 5, but let's look uh, briefly at uh, John chapter 6. Um, Jesus says a very remarkable thing here in the midst of saying some, <laughs> a bunch of remarkable things. In verse 43, Jesus answers and says to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, look at verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. 
Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. That's what I'm talking about by this learning, by inquiry and observation to the point where it is in, becomes ingrained in us, becomes habit to us. He says, everybody who hears, but not just hears, but learns of the Father. When we, when we hear what He's saying and learn what He's saying, what does it produce in us? We come to Jesus. What can you say about the people who don't come to Jesus? They haven't heard or they haven't learned. <laughs> that got quiet. What can you say about believers who don't come to Jesus? Believers who don't want assignments from Jesus? Believers who don't talk to Jesus? Believers who don't uh, habitually check in and intentionally listen to and submit to Jesus? They haven't learned. They need to pay attention to what the Spirit of God is telling them. Is that making a little bit of sense to you? Yes. Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm finishing Hebrews here, having been made perfect, having completed what was before him, he became to all those who obey him, to all those who, who listen under, to all those for whom his voice is a command. the source of eternal salvation. Is that kind of exciting? Yes. Now let's go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. At the very last verse, verse 52 says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now we're talking about Jesus as a boy here. And it tells us four specific ways in which he was growing. Ways in which he was increasing or advancing. And uh, in that definition, it says that it stresses steady incremental progress. This is, this is what our Lord, the forerunner, He grew, he increased, he advanced in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Four tangible measures for growth, right? It got quiet all of a sudden. In, in, have we got something to increase in? You're looking a little bit like it. Now, it's, it's grace. Now, understand this. 1 Peter 5, 5 tells us that God gives grace to the humble, but uh, King James, he resists the proud. Um, he resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Uh, those of you who were in a men's meeting yesterday, uh, Robert Berenger was, was uh, uh, saying that we could understand that grace as open doors and resistance as closed doors. And understanding that grace opens doors for us that we don't have any necessary right or expectation should be open, but we find them open. And we ought to go through them. But when we're proud, doors are closed to us and everything becomes difficult. Right? That's the picture. Grace is open doors. Now you say, why are we talking about grace? We were talking, well, because we're, we're backing up to last week where we understand that grace, part of the grace which is given to me is my opportunity to serve. My being placed in the body of Christ, my having any assignment at all is grace. When Adam is placed in the garden, he hasn't earned it and he doesn't deserve it. It's just given to him. And when we're placed in the body of Christ, we haven't earned it and we don't deserve it. It's given to us. And what's important to recognize about that is that we, we, we think about passages where, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, three times at least it tells us that we're placed according to His will, according to His good pleasure, that He's the one who does the placing. 
In, in Romans chapter 12, I think it's verse 6 tells us that we're given grace that differs according, or uh, excuse me, we have assignments which differ according to the grace which is given to us. And that's where some of us start to sulk and say, yeah, and I wanted that assignment, but God didn't give me that grace. But back up. That you've got an assignment is grace. We can fight about whose assignment we like or which assignment I would have wanted, but none of us deserved an assignment. And instead of looking at somebody and saying, man, look at that guy. He's singing on TV. Could be me. I have a lovely voice. I mean, very untrained, very raw. But with a little practice, man, that could have been me. That I've got something to do that I'm ignoring while I'm feeling sorry for myself is grace. I have been shown favor that I didn't deserve by getting an assignment. What kind of nuts is it to sit around and try to decide if I would have liked another assignment better? I got one. Let's go back to the parable of the talents. If I'm the guy with the two talents, am I looking at the guy with five saying, man, he's got five. What I could do with five. Oh, man, if I could just get my hands on five. Or am I looking at the guy who had the one that he had taken from him and was told to depart, the wicked and lazy servant, and saying, glad that's not me. You guys are looking strangely at me. Am I burned because I didn't get the most talents or am I glad to have any talents and not be the guy who needs to leave? Which way am I going to run this thing? Am I excited about grace or am I upset about what other options were available? It's real quiet out here this morning. I wasn't planning to be quite that hard on your toes. Here's the thing about grace, just the very word grace, when we encounter it in the scriptures, and it it sometimes gets translated as other things besides grace, but most of the time grace, but as we encounter that word, if it's being described from the side of the giver, it describes favor. But when it's being described from the side of the receiver, it's called thanks. When God gives me grace, He shows favor. When I receive grace, I give thanks. And if there isn't much thanksgiving going on, then you're doing a bad job of receiving grace. Because the very word gets translated thanks when it's describing the attitude or perspective of the person who's received it. Are you still glad you came? So, Jesus is advancing in wisdom. Not just piling up information, but understanding how to use that information to make decisions and navigate. People are not wise for what they know. They're wise for what they do with what they know. I used to occasionally ask people to raise their hands on this, but that sometimes is embarrassing. But in a group this size, I can almost guarantee you that somebody here has at some point destroyed an automobile's engine by driving it with too little oil in it. (laughs) Now I'm getting hands anyway, yeah. Here's the question. Did any of us not know that the engine needs oil? Did any of us not know that you're supposed to check the oil? Did any of us not know how to check the oil? The answer is probably not. It's not what we knew that ruined that engine. It's not what we didn't know that ruined that engine. It's what we didn't do with what we knew that ruined that engine. Most people who get themselves into fixes Don't do it for lack of information. They do it for lack of wisdom with the information they already had. (laughs) 
I'm so glad I came. <laughs> Most of us are excited to gather more information. I need more information, more information. Need new information. Don't like the old information. I need new information. But the challenge has been consistently, what are we doing with the information we've got? We don't call people wise for what they've accumulated in the way of information. We call them wise for what they do with the information they've got. Jesus grew in wisdom. Of course he was adding information, but it wasn't just information. He wasn't becoming the human encyclopedia. As he was growing through childhood, he was developing the ability to make the right choices and use the information correctly. He also grew in stature, which is suggesting both uh, that the term can mean either age or physical. You know, I mean, he got in the same way that we use the word big. What does the word big literally mean? It means large, right? But if we say that a child is getting big, we, we mean we might mean that they're growing physically, but we might also mean that they're getting older, developing maturity in the process. This word in the Greek has both of those applications in that same way. It generally is describing growing up physically, but it can also mean advancing in age and maturity. But in either case, what's happening here is that physical development is taking place. He's got the wisdom thing happening. He's also getting his body to the place that it needs to be. He's growing up. He's developing physical stature and the, the coordination and skill that comes with physical stature so that he can be the man that he needs to be. But then these last two, and these are the ones that, that I'm kind of excited about this morning. He grew in favor with God. Now you might think, isn't this my only begotten son in whom I'm well pleased? Doves, voices from heaven. and how, how do you get better than that? Well, I don't think he attracted more favor from the Father. But he, as a person growing and maturing, needed to become increasingly aware of and skilled in discerning the Father's favor. He comes to a point in his life where he says, I only ever do what I see my father doing. I only ever say what I hear my father saying. That is not the point he was at when he's born in Bethlehem. That is not the point he's at when he gets separated from the family on a trip and causes a panic. He doesn't say when they find him, well, I was just doing what I saw the father in heaven do. It's not my fault if you people don't pray. Are you home? You're not sure whether you like that or not. These guys over here are picking up stones. I'll go this way for a little while. He's growing through a process of discerning and being aware of the favor, where it is. To, to go back into Robert Berenger's uh, vernacular, he's discovering how to tell when doors are open. To know where the doors are open in his life. To see where the Father has opened doors for him. That's a, that's a tough one. As long as I've been kicking around, you'd think that I would know how to tell when a door is open and when it's closed. And yet I discover that I'm not as good at this as I need to be. I need to grow in favor with God. Not because He's going to give me more favor, but because I need to be better at understanding the favor that He's given me. I need to be better at perceiving where the favor is. I need to be better at discerning what favor is doing. So that I can walk in that. But it's not just favor with God. He's advancing or increasing in favor with man. He's developing through a process of understanding when people have opened doors to him and when they haven't. 
And a lot of us spend a lot of our lives trying to kick open doors that aren't open and ignoring doors that are and finding it to be a very frustrating and unpleasant experience. And whether those doors have to do with God directly or whether they have to do with just the people around us, in either case, it's a big deal learning how to follow favor that way. Is this making a little bit of sense to you? If we're going to be committed to being people that grow, if we're engaged in growing, if growing is what matters, and we understand that the assignments that are brought into our lives are brought in to develop us. I receive assignments from God because He's developing me. Because I'm not everything that I ought to be, and part of the process to get me to where I ought to be is that He's given me stuff to do. Not because He can't do it. Not because He can't do it without me. But because He loves me enough to want to see me do it. He's going to let me try to do this thing. As we come to, to grasp that, if we're, if we're going to be engaged in this, we're going to have to quit seeing assignments as burdensome and recognize them as blessing. Is that making a little bit of sense to you? Well, um, let, let's come on over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to try to wind this down a little bit. Man... Some of these things are so deep and rich that there just isn't an end to them. But in chapter 11, very famous passage. Jesus says at the very end of chapter 11, beginning of verse 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When he invites me, when he says, take my yoke upon you, he doesn't say, take my yoke from me. He says, take my yoke upon you. Well, a yoke, is that's what we call that device which hooks two animals together so that they can work as a team. If it's... His yoke, who's on the other side? Him. Well, that's a special assignment. I'm going to enter into this yoke, and he's going to be yoked with me. And we're going to do this together now. He's not going to do it and then come tell me how it went. And he's not sending me to do it and come back and tell him how it went. We're going to go and do this thing together. Whatever it is, he's calling me into his yoke with him. This is not talking about taking a nap. It's talking about work. It's talking about ministry, service, growing through serving. He says, you feel tired, you feel beat down, you feel ruined, you feel like life is just wearing you to a nub, you feel like you can't take anymore. He doesn't say, pull over in the rest area and take a nap. He says, come here and try this yoke. Do this with me my way. Come and learn obedience, listening under. By wearing this yoke and being fastened to me. Most of you have heard me tell a time or two. When I was a boy, we used to go to Sturbridge Village routinely. And one of my favorite things was, was oxen. I, I've always liked the big animals. If I go to one of these uh, farms, fairs, uh, whatever, the Big E, the Brooklyn Fair, whatever, the thing that I want to go watch is horses and oxen pulling things. That's where the fun is for me. We go to the zoo. I want to go see the rhinoceros. <laughs> big animals. Big guys. Burn more calories just flexing and thinking about moving and then deciding not to than I do running a mile. You know what I'm talking about? They got 400-pound neck. 
up at the Big E one year looking at the, the Clydesdales in their stalls. These horses, the light ones were going 1,700 and change. The big ones were over 2,000 pounds. They got hooves like that. This is amazing. That's what I like. So I'm going to Sturbridge Village. I'm watching the oxen do their thing. And then they had calves. Not the oxen did, but they had them there at Sturbridge Village. And then a couple of these calves, as they got just a little older, were selected to become the next generation of oxen. And so we're watching them in their pen as they get a little older, and we keep coming, and they're getting a little bigger. And then we're, we're getting to the point where we're seeing them out with the cart. But, you know, you don't see those two out together. That's ridiculous. That's going to be a mess. Put the two of them out together. Where did, what do we see? We see one of the big old oxen with one of these young ones yoked beside him. Now this is not a good match. This is not going to give you maximum efficiency for work. But what you are going to discover is, you, you know, you got 1,400 pounds of ox standing here. This guy is going berserk, but he isn't going anywhere. Because you got 1,400 pounds of ox standing here saying, what is the matter with you, kid? And the driver has got the cart moving and we're going and we're stopping and we're turning left and we're turning right and this one's just doing everything. He's dancing, he's got his feet, he's getting sideways on the yoke, he's coming, he's not taking the turn and getting dragged around the turn, you know. But he's got no chance of slowing down this big guy. And he's learning in the process because how does this team of crazy young calves who like to run and skip and jump and kick the fence and don't pay any attention to any instructions become a team of master oxen which can tow anything here, which can pull a rock out of the ground or a stump out of the ground, drag logs out of the woods, works together, have that bored ox look on their face like, there's nothing too heavy for me, let's go. (laughs) How do do these, these crazy wild things become that they stand in a yoke with somebody who knows what he's doing and they learn when Jesus says take my yoke upon you and learn from me he's not telling us to have a quick sip of water take a breather on the bench and then we can go back in and try life again on our own He's saying the problem here is that you're doing it on your own. You weren't supposed to be. Get in this yoke with me and learn. Pay attention here by questions, by inquiry and observation. Let's ingrain this till it becomes habit and you can call yourself a disciple. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. He's the humble who finds grace, not the proud who finds resistance. And He can teach you how to see where the doors are open instead of always banging into the closed doors. But here, are you ready to finish this? You all see the finish line? Ready to give it the gas? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now that phrase, my burden is light, means just what it sounds like it means. It's not heavy, it's light. But when he says my yoke is easy, there's a reference in the margin of this Bible which is not as helpful as I would like it to be, but it says uh, the word easy could have been rendered comfortable or pleasant. My yoke is comfortable, my yoke is pleasant. But it actually is a word which we have encountered in a variety of other settings. It's a word which sometimes gets translated goodness. Its core meaning is employed. Therefore, usefulness. Therefore, it describes graciousness, kindness, goodness, things which are fruitful, efficient, produce what they're supposed to. Are you getting the picture? When he says my yoke is easy, what he says, probably a a more biblically consistent way of saying it would be my yoke is good. And what he means by good 
is that it gets the job done. You can become fruitful in this yoke. You can wear many yokes. You can wear yokes that just leave you with, 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 with wounds and calluses, with, with abrasions. You can wear yokes that never feel right. You can wear yokes that blister. You can wear yokes that you can't move. You can try any yoke you want, but His yoke is fruitful, is efficient. It's engaged and doing something. When we come into His yoke, we get something done. Do you see the power of this invitation? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Parenthetical note, those of you who have worn yourself out doing it your way. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is that good news? Let's stand up together if you will. In the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, it says at the 9th and the 10th verses that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. We can learn through obedience that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation. It's an invitation, an offer, if you will, that God puts before us. It's a command. It's an instruction which God proclaims to us. And the choice that we have is to submit and obey or to continue to resist. And I'm so grateful that I finally quit resisting, broke down, and obeyed. I'm going to pray and testify of my believing this morning. For some reason, the Amplified Bible's uh, amplification of faith, one of, the, one of the amplifications they use repeatedly is trust in, rely upon, and adhere to. And that phrase has just been rolling over and over in my mind. I don't know just why. But believing is trusting in, relying on, adhering to. And I want to give voice to my trusting Him, my relying on Him, my adhering to Him. And I'm going to invite you to join me if you would like to. Dear God, I thank you in Jesus' name for hearing me today. I do believe in my heart that you've raised Jesus from the dead. And I declare... With my own mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Father, for this believing that you've given me, that I might trust in, that I might rely upon, that I might adhere to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for new life in Jesus' name, Jesus name. Amen. amen.